This conference will now be recorded. Uh, so hello everyone and welcome to the fourth installment of the NWBA webinar series. Uh, I wanna thank you guys once again for joining us tonight. I'm Christina Schwab and again, I'll be the moderator for tonight's webinar, Athlete Safety, Creating a Safe Environment for All to Play, Learn and Compete. Tonight's webinar is presented to you by ABC Medical. So ABC Medical is a proud partner of the NWBA and is, is honored to participate in this webinar series. Um, before we get started tonight, I just have a few housekeeping items. Um, just to remind everyone that the um, during the webinar, uh, you will be muted during the presentation. If you have any questions that pertain to the materials tonight, just make sure that you're using the chat box. We're gonna be monitoring that chat box and we'll have some time at the end of the presentation to go over any questions you might have. And if you can't stay through the entire presentation or if there's anyone that you want to see this maybe later on, we will provide a recording of tonight's uh, session on the NWBA website. And so now I would like to introduce to you tonight's presenter, Tina Kane. Mm -hmm. uh, so Tina just joined us, uh, the NWBA national office team in April of this year as the business and compliance manager. In this role, she oversees athlete safety initiatives and compliance, including background checks and safe sport training and education. She also manages governance policies and assists with USOPC reporting and auditing uh, compliance. Um, Tina in the past has formerly served as the US Paralympics Associate Director of Paralympic Track and Field National Teams. She also directed US Paralympics um, annually hosted events, which included World Para Athletics Grand Prix and the National Championships. In addition, Tina has served as a track and field team leader for multiple Paralympic Games, World Championships and Para Pan American Game teams. Um, prior to Joining the USOPC, Tina worked at USA Track and Field as the High Performance Programs Coordinator. Tina is a graduate from Indiana State University, holding a Bachelor's of Science degree in Sport Management with a minor in Business Administration. So thank you, Tina, for being a part of the series. Um, we're really excited for your presentation, and I'm going to turn it over to you. And I'll get the next slide going for you. Okay. There we go. Brandon, do you want to start off? Yeah, sorry, I wanted to jump in there. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for teeing everything up, Christina. I just want to add um, to, we're really excited uh, to add ABC Medical as a presenting sponsor of this webinar series. ABC Medical has been a proud partner of the NWBA for a number of years, and ABC Medical is one of the nation's large uh, leading uh, urological supply providers, and they have a comprehensive line of medical supplies and service um, to our members. And so we're really excited to have them come on board. Um, and we've been partnering with them on a, a variety of different programs over the years, but we're adding this one to the mix. And so I'm just excited to have them on board to uh, understand that educating our members through these webinar series is a really valuable thing. Um, so very appreciative of their support and uh, being a part, a great partner to the NWBA. So one of they give a little shout out to ABC Medical and we look forward to their support uh, continuing during the webinar series. So now I'll pass it on to Tina. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Well, thank you, Christina and Brandon, um, for walking through that and getting us introduced here. So um, just we're going to go ahead and just roll right into it. Uh, the first thing we're going to cover um, here is just talking through the session objectives. So what we're going to take, what are your takeaways um, from tonight's session? So this webinar is designed um, to help participants understand the NWBA's prioritization of athlete safety initiatives. So this stems from leadership from the board of directors, staff, divisional leadership, officials, team administration. And it's very important for everyone to know um, that the number one priority is to create a culture of safety within the NWBA. Uh, and then the second um, thing here is we're going to cover the athlete safety policies, procedures, resources, training, screenings, and preventative measures. These are things that all members of the NWBA are responsible for knowing and held accountable to implement. 
And then the third thing here is the importance of athlete safety requirements and being in good standing with the NWBA. So the athlete safety requirements are not an option for applicable adults. And they're basically must haves for members to be compliant and to be in good standing with the NWBA. So while these aren't very light topics, they are very important. Um, so just down there on the bottom of the slide, you're gonna see an, um, two examples of headlines. And these are probably very familiar with everyone's he everyone that's here. Um, so the sex abuse scandal surrounding USA and Gymnastics and the Penn State child abuse scandal, which like I said, is a very, very popular in the media. But basically the thing here is these stories and these situations are horrific. And we never want these to take place or happen within our sport or with any of our programs. So thankfully, none of these headlines include the NWBA and we need to all work together to make sure that it stays that way. So here we are with the first part of athlete safety. Um, so we're gonna jump right in here to safe sport. And one thing before I, um, before I kind of dive in here, I just wanna make a point that the majority of this presentation is gonna cover um, the components of safe sport. And while that is a very important um, component of athlete safety and all of the components are important, um, safe sport is majority here because it's a little bit newer. So background checks and other things like the code of conduct and waivers and concussion information and things like that, they've been around for a while. So they feel a little bit more familiar where realistically the Safe Sport Act and, Act and the US Center for Safe Sport Programming really have only been implemented when the, within the past three years. So it's a little bit newer and it's just a little bit as, it's not as familiar as the other stuff. So we will focus on that for the majority of the presentation. Um, it also covers a lot of content um, is included in Safe Sport. So you'll see that um, that's a lot of why it takes up the majority of the presentation here. So. Um, so the first thing here just talks about um, the act. So unfortunately, with too many of the headlines that you saw from the first um, slide there, Congress basically had to take action, which brings us to the Safe Sport Act. So it's the Protecting Young Victims from Sexual Abuse and Safe Sport Authorization Act of 2017. And basically, Congress designed or designated the U.S. Center for Safe Sport to serve as the national safe sport organization. So they responded to reports of sexual misconduct and develop national policies and procedures to prevent emotional, physical, and sexual abuse in amateur athletes within the US Olympic and Paralympic movements. Um, obviously the act is much longer than that. There's a link to it on our website if you wanna read through all of it. We'll reference it a couple of times throughout the presentation. So if you hear me call it the act, that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about. And then two other things here, the US Center for Safe Sport, we refer to that as the center. So that's kind of their acronym. So if you hear me talk about the center throughout the presentation, that's what we're referring to. And then there's two governing documents that basically cover all of the initiatives in the program. Um, they're kind of the core of what everything's built around. So those two governing documents are the Safe Sport Code and the MAP, um, which we, which is, an acronym for the Minor Athlete Abuse Prevention Policies, which if you can say that 10 times fast, you get extra credit. Um, okay. So um, the Safe Sport Code and the map that we just talked about, along with all of our resources, so everything that pertains or that's um, been created from the NWBA, plus all of the US Center for Safe Sport resources are on our website. So consider that like a one-stop shop for everything. So it's a long page, um, but it includes everything. So it makes it really easy to reference if you need any of the safe sport documents. So the link is there, it's the nwba.org and then slash safe sport. And um, that, you can actually probably pull it up on your computer if you wanna follow along with all of the documents. But everything that we're gonna talk about tonight is there. And then there's a few other resources that are there as well. Um, 
So just to kind of reiterate, these policies and re resources assist in the development of athlete safeguards, as well as help provide each athlete with a safe sport environment free from abuse and misconduct. Um, and just a side note there, that's just kind of a reiteration of why we're here and, and why these programs are here and what we're trying to do. Um, but throughout this presentation, you're gonna see that a lot of these slides are listed in full sentences versus most presentations are done kind of in a bullet um, short point style. But it's important to know that there's specific wording that's used in this safe sport world and a lot of this information is taken directly from either a policy or procedure and we want to stress the importance of that detailed information to be as clear and concise um, as possible to avoid any confusion um, so it's important to know that um, that all of this is here for a reason so jumping in here into the code and the map um, so these are evolving governing documents, meaning that they're typically updated annually, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer, but they're ever evolving. And so while you may seem familiar with the document um, today, it might be six months down the road that a new document that the center updates it or changes a policy or you know, finds new things out that they need to make sure is covered in the policies. So just know that it's important to be familiar with the website and know that there are updates made to those. And then obviously when those updates are made, we're, we make it very clear um, to membership and make sure those communications are sent out and so does the center. Um, so read these documents. Um, that's the important piece is to know them. and. It's important to make sure that you're familiar with them to protect our athletes, our sport, and yourself. And we'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about protecting yourself, when we dive a little bit more into the map here in a second. But just to touch a little bit on the code, um, the code basically covers everything that relates to the US Center for Safe Sport and their programs. So anything that governs their program is included in that code. And every, every member, meaning every member of the NWBA, in addition to the bigger global scope of anyone included in the Olympic and Paralympic movement, um, is responsible for knowing that information and they're required to comply with the policies and procedures that's outlined in that document. It's 53 pages long, it's rather extensive, um, but it's important to know how the program works, how it functions, how it applies to you, and what happens if there's a situation that comes up um, in, in knowing how that process works. So then diving into the map. So the map includes basically six different components to it. So they're all listed here, the one-on-one -on -one interactions, the massages and rub downs, athletic training modalities, locker rooms and changing areas, social media and electronic communications, the local travel and the team travel. Um, and then you'll see there's a link there with a document called the map overview. So that document is actually posted on our website. So it's basically just a snapshot of the overall document of the map. But I'll tell you this, by the time you can read through the overview that the US Center for Safe Sport published to make it a little bit easier to digest, you can read through the entire map. So the map is only 10 pages and two of them are title pages. So technically it's seven and a half. Um, so by the time you read through one, you can really read through the full policy. Um, it's very readable, it's ap applicable to the NWBA, it's written that way. Um, so just know that, um, that that's available and it's, it's pretty easy, it's a pretty easy document to digest. So I'm just gonna, I'm going to briefly touch on a couple things within this overview document. So the first page of it basically covers who it applies to and how it applies, um, which I'll get to that here in a couple of slides. But it just goes through each of the components, um, each of the six components that are listed there, and kind of gives a snapshot of what they look like. So for example, on the one-on-one -on -one interactions, it talks about how 
the interactions have to be observable and interruptible. And that's pretty consistent wording throughout all of the six policies. And so, for example, if there's an athlete that's meeting with a, like a healthcare professional, one of the requirements is the door can be closed, but it can't be unlocked, or I'm sorry, the door can be closed, but it must be unlocked. So when I was talking about before, when I was, I was saying to read through the documents to protect our athletes and our sport and yourself, there's a little, there's a couple of nuances here that I just want to point out that may seem like they're harmless or it's not an issue or it's not a problem. For example, if there's somebody meeting in like an older building or it's kind they kind of have those doors um, that are like hotel style. So when they close, they automatically lock. That's kind of in your setup of your day-to-day -day work life. And that may seem like something that's very normal. But in this instance, if you, if a health professional is meeting with an athlete, that door has to be unlocked, but it can be closed. And so there needs to be changes made in order to be compliant with the policy. So that's why I say that it's important for everybody to read through it. It's important to know these things that on the outside may seem like they're not a problem, but they really are against the policies. So one other piece that um, I kind of want to talk about specifically to the map um, is I'm going to jump forward into the policy that covers social media and electronic communications. And I'm jumping into that because that's a piece that's in everyone's world right now, right? We're doing it as we're talking through this presentation. And so it's important to know how that piece applies. And I don't want to discredit any of the six policies. I'm just using these two as examples because there's pieces in there that may seem like they're not a problem or that they wouldn't be against the policy when in fact they actually are and we may need to make changes within our teams and our divisions and how they and how they interact through social media and electronic communications so for example i know there's a lot of teams and a lot of divisions that use their facebook pages um, and things like that and i'm sure that in those groups those are private groups facebook has a function where you can do private messaging and with minor athletes, you have to have a parent or guardian part of those private conversations. They can't be one-on-one -on -one with just the minor athlete. And so if that's going on, then it's against the policy. So just knowing those types of things and those little nuances that are in this policy, I think is really important, um, especially in this day and age where, like I said, social media and all of electronic communications, whether it's email or Instagram or Snapchat or Facebook or whatever it is, is so familiar and everyone's using it in their day-to-day -day functions of their program. So it's important to read through the overview just to have a digestible snapshot of what the map looks like, but it's also real, really important to read through the actual policies and know how they apply. Um, and then just another note on this piece of it, so the code and the map, so these two governing, governing documents, um, all NWBA membership registrations, so anybody going through that membership process, um, this season for 20, 2020 and then 2021 will include a required safe sport policies acknowledgement of these documents. So basically you'll have to sign that you agree that you've received these documents and you understand them and know basically how they apply to you and your teams and programs and, and athletes and so on and so forth. So let me get back into my notes here. Maybe. Sorry, technical difficulty here. So one other note um, that I just want to touch on is I had mentioned on the last slide, and Christina, you don't need to go back, but um, one thing that I mentioned there is that there, you know, those governing documents are are legal documents, so they're long, um, and and sometimes that detailed specific wording can seem confusing. So if there's ever questions about how that detailed information applies or the interpretation of it. 
don't hesitate to reach out to us to ask. This is why we're here. This is why we implement these programs. We're all a team and we'll work through it together. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask any of us of, of how it applies and kind of what it means. Um, so jumping in here, so still on safe sport, we're gonna talk through a little bit of the training and what we refer to a lot of times as applicable adults. So the following adults affiliated with the NWBA and collectively as applicable adults, we'll refer to that, we'll use that term a lot um, throughout the document, the rest of the document here. So all of the applicable adults are required to complete the U.S. Center for Safe Sport training, which provides the required child abuse prevention training mandated by federal law, which goes back to the act. So this is how this applies to the NWBA specifically. So all members that are 18 years or older, all members who are 17 years old must complete the training prior to them turning 18, prior to their 18th birthday. And then all adults engaged in activities um, with NWBA members that are minor athletes, and these adults include, but are not limited to, the board of directors, the employees, staff, contractors, interns, and et cetera. So just to give a little detail on that et cetera um, piece of it, that, um, that includes floor officials, classifiers, divisional leadership. Basically, here's how it applies. If anyone who is 18 years old or older and you're a member of the NWBA, you're required to take this training. And again, like I mentioned before, it's not an option. So it's now tied into our membership registration, which we'll get into here in a little bit. But basically, membership does, doesn't become active until that training is completed and that it's current. So that's kind of the applicable applicable adults piece in the specifics of how it applies. So here we're gonna go through some participation requirements. So this kind of goes into what I was just talking about, about that eligibility piece. So I'm gonna reference a couple of other documents here, the, including the map with the NWBA policies and procedures. I'm sure everyone is familiar with that document already. Um, but it, that basically outlines that all individuals must have a verified complete NWBA, an athlete, junior or adult, and a non or a non-athlete registration 10 days prior to their first competition of a sanctioned event. So if you're registering within 10 days of an NWBA sanctioned event, you're, you're not eligible to participate. And this rule isn't anything, anything new. We're just reiterating basically what's already been there in that participation requirement because it ties into basically all of the components of having a verified complete registration includes all of the pieces that go along with it. So whether it's submitting the birth certificate as a junior athlete, or in this case, it's gonna be submitting that safe sport training, completing the background check component. So all of those pieces kind of fall into that um, and those are the requirements. And those take a while to process, which is why there's a 10 day requirement. Um, those don't happen overnight to go through the background check and that sort of thing. So that's why that requirement is there. So then outlined in the um, outlined in the map, this piece um, basically covers that that training has to be has to be done. So the way it works is the first year the U.S. Center for Safe Sport requires what they call core, and that's basically the name of the course that they use that you take in year one, and then in subsequent years, so years after that. You'll take refresher one, then refresher two, then refresher three. And then basically the system repeats itself. So it almost works like a quad. So it goes through the four years and then it, and then um, members will go back and retake core, then refresher one, refresher two, refresher three. So that's kind of the system that the U.S. Center for Safe Sport has set up and they'll basically use to go through through all of the trainings. And those trainings are required to be done in that particular order. So um, the next thing here, it talks about the safe sport training um, is valid for the NWBA membership registration for the season in which it's completed. 
So the way that the training is going to work and the way it's tied to membership, and there's an example here that I'm going to kind of walk through. So if an individual submits their core training, so that first year of training, on the first day that registration opens this year, so September 2nd, then they'll go through, um, basically the membership is valid until um, they come back to register the following year. So for this example, um, John here is gonna register on September 2nd of this year when his membership expires next year. He's gonna come in on September 1st to make sure that he can get all of those requirements done so that he can get everything submitted and be and be current. And then he'll take the refresher two course, or I'm sorry, the refresher one course, because that's the subsequent, um, the course that'll, that'll, um, that he would take after that in order to remain compliant. Um, so that's kind of a, um, a new piece that goes along with the safe sport training being integrated with our membership is that's how it'll work. It'll basically, the expiration dates will coincide with the, with the season. And hopefully that makes it easier to remember when you have to go in and do all of your trainings. Um, so I'm going to get into this just a little bit more, um, talking through the training and how you access it. Um, but I just want to preface it with this. So we're still working with um, that safe sport training integration piece is still being built out with Sports Engine, who hosts our um, website and then hosts our membership registration system. And then 77 Media is the company that the US Center for Safe Sport uses on their end. So that piece is still being built out. Um, it's been rolled out for a couple of sports, ours included, um, but there's other NGBs that are using that same type of integration, but it is a newer system. So just know that we're still in the process of that integration and, and making that training available. So there may be a lot of extra communications, there may be some hiccups all along the way, um, but just know that this piece is still kind of being built out. So there might be um, you know, more information and obviously a lot of communication that comes out in the beginning to make sure that everybody understands how it works and the process in which we're going to use um, to keep everybody compliant with their safe sport training. So the individual, um, so just kind of covering here, this, this kind of covers what I mentioned before, that the appropriate safe sport training, so core, then refresher one, refresher two, and refresher three, basically are going to be accessed upon completion of completing an individual membership registration. So depending on which type of registration you've completed, basically what will happen is the individual membership for adult athletes and non-athletes will get, they'll have direct athlete um, access to the training by clicking, there's a complete certification button in um, the confirmation welcome email that you get once you've submitted um, the registration. So then it's pretty simple process in terms of you click the button from your welcome email, it takes you to a screen to be able to put in your information, um, to put in your completion codes if you've already taken the core um, or the refresher one training, and then it will get you directly into the appropriate training that you're supposed to take. The process is going to be a little bit different for the applicable individuals that are submitting a junior athlete registration. So again, that goes back to those applicable adults. So it's basically 17 years old, turning 18 before their 18th birthday, or individuals that are 18 years or older um, having to do that requirement. So currently, the way that the system is going to work isn't going to change from last year. And the registration that we used um, to um, collect that safe sport training information. So they'll basically, registrants through that method will receive an email within 24 hours of submitting their registration with all the instructions plus the access code to complete the training, um, along with all of the instructions, obviously, of how to then, once the completing some um, the certificate is completed, the training is completed, to be able to upload their completion certificate back into their um, membership registration so that everything can include the, safe, the proper safe sport documentation. Um, so again, this is 
this is the plan, um, but we're, we're gonna put together um, some additional documents and obviously there'll be more communications with specific details of how that process works. Um, and, and they'll be communicated through all of our methods, through email and through the website um, to make sure that everyone has a clear um, understanding of how that process works dependent upon the, the registration that you're completing. So everything that we've talked about up until now has applied to that applicable adult group that I mentioned at the beginning. So this slide is gonna shift a little bit. So this, this training and this information here is it applies to minors and, and, and parents. So we're kind of out of that applicable adult group. So these trainings here, unlike the trainings that are available for the applicable adults that are required, these trainings are strongly suggested for youth and minor athletes and for parents, they are not required. Um, they're really good trainings. It's really good information and it's very good education. So just to touch on a couple of things here. So they're published by the US Center for Safe Sport who also does the trainings for the applicable adults, but they're free age appropriate trainings that are basically designed as an introduction for athletes and parents to understand the importance of positive welcoming environments in sports where misconduct like bullying and abuse is less likely to happen and know where to report abuse should it occur. So then the link here um, basically takes us back to that same website. So everything is on our website. You can get to a flyer which talks about the different um, trainings that are available. Then it also has the link to get to the actual training. It requires parental guardian um, consent. So um, just kind of knowing that piece in advance. And then shifting to the parents. So to best protect our athletes from abuse and misconduct, it's critical that parents and guardians are familiar with these safe sport policies too, to ensure that interactions between their children and adults involved in the NWBA programs are in compliance with the rules and regulations for those interactions. The NWBA strongly encourages parents and legal guardians to make their children aware of these safe sport policies and they should not permit their children to participate in interactions that are not in compliance with those safe sport policies. So just some important specific information there about how it applies. And then there's also a link to the parent toolkit, which talks through those different age appropriate trainings. And then it also talks about the, um, the parent's guide to misconduct, which is the training for the parents specifically that they can take to understand what to recognize, how to report um, and things like that. So just two important pieces there um, for the minor athletes and then for, um, for parents. So those are gonna be really important to share with teams and divisions and programs to make sure that they know that those things are available. Um, so reporting. So safe sport reporting. Um, so as outlined in the map, which um, we've covered before, so all individuals, regardless of membership with the NWBA, are encouraged to report suspected safe sport violations. There's a component here that talks about the directors, officers, employees, and members are required to report a, a suspected safe sport violation. Those are people within our organization that are essentially required reporters. Um, but anyone can report a suspected safe sport violation. And I think that's an important piece for people to know. Um, because I think that's been a common misconception in the past. So then suspected child abuse and sexual misconduct is required to be reported with the U.S. Center for Safe Sport and with local law enforcement. And the and piece in that sentence is very important because it, it is required by law to be reported to both. So if it's child abuse or sexual misconduct, and we'll talk about jurisdiction here in a second, if it's one of those two categories, then it has to be required to both the law, local law enforcement and with the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. The next piece that's, um, that's linked in here refers to the response and resolution process. Again, it's another link. I'm gonna sound like a broken record here. That's on our website. And it's basically, it's almost like a flow chart. It basically defines out how to report 
based on which bucket it falls into. And so it's a good resource um, from the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, and it covers their jurisdictions and our jurisdictions. So basically what they've done is tried to call out different, um, different scenarios, whether it's bullying or hazing or child abuse, sexual misconduct, and they've tried to put in different boxes for that. So some of those things fall under the NWBA jurisdiction. Some of them fall under the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. It's kind of confusing to know that. And, and please know that a lot of times in real life, when things like these happen and these, these horrible situations come up, they don't always fit into one box. It may be confusing and it's a gray area of whose jurisdiction it, it covers. So that's why this note in here is the center. So the US Center for Safe Sport, they're the default way to report. If there's ever a question or there's ever a concern, that's always the default way to go. We do have both processes um, posted on our website. Both of them have an anonymous option to them. And so there's two, basically two buttons in the reporting section on our website. So one you click on and it reports directly to the US Center for Safe Sport. One you click on it reports directly into the NWBA. The jurisdictions are defined there a little bit, but again, if you have questions or concerns or don't know which jurisdiction it covers, then always default to the center. That's the best way to go. So the biggest piece here is to know how to report suspected violations. And then again, it has a link to the website. So suspected is the key word there. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to have a specific text message or some sort of documentation or hire a private investigator to know what's going on. If there is abuse or sexual misconduct in any way, shape or form that you're aware of and that you suspect it might be going on, report it. If, you, if you're ever in doubt, report it. It's always good to be on the safe side of that and to have a report that maybe doesn't end up with some sort of sanction in the end, it's always good to know the information and to know how to report and to know that the option is there and to know that either the center or the NWBA or law enforcement, depending on which jurisdiction it falls into, is going to do that work to make sure that that's not taking place. So of all of the information you take away from this slide, when in doubt, report it and know where to report. Go to the website and click on one of the links and report it through the, the options that we have there. Um, so the other thing, um, sorry, Christina, I'm getting, I'm going behind on you. Um, I just wanna refer back to the act really quick on that piece. So um, there's one line within the Safe Sport Act, um, and I'm gonna read it because it's important. An authorized adult who fails to report suspected child abuse within a 24 hour period is subject to criminal penalties. So know that when we talked about that second bullet point where it says that the child abuse and sexual misconduct is required to be reported to both the center and local law enforcement, that that piece is really important. So knowing that reporting process, um, which is included in part of the map of those governing documents um, is really important. Sorry, Christina, you can go ahead now. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna shift out of safe sport and we're gonna go into the background check. So like I mentioned earlier, background checks have been around for a little bit longer. They're a little bit more familiar. They've been included into our membership registration in the past, so everyone kind of knows that system and knows how it works. Um, there's one um, change that's going to be coming up, but in terms of the logistics of how the background check is submitted and done through our system won't change. So beginning with the 2021 season and basically moving forward on, the NWBA is going to conduct annual screenings, which is a shift from um, changing from every two years, which is which it was previously. So it's like I mentioned before, it's required and included with the non-athlete membership registration process. It's a very um, it's very well integrated, and so it just feels like it's part of the process of doing your membership registration, which is really nice. 
Um, so just kind of going back into that um, into that change, the board of directors passed that updated requirement on the annual screenings to ensure that we continue to monitor who who has access to athletes and um, and the sport. Again, placing that emphasis on the importance of a culture of safety. So you can you can see a trend um, across the board here where we're trying to make it known that it's an, it's our number one priority within the NWBA to make athlete safety very important. And then background checks are conducted by the National Center for Safe Sport Initiatives, NCSI. Um, don't get the acronym confused and it'll be the television show. Um, and then also with Sports Engine. So Sports Engine is who hosts our membership registration. And so they work with NC. Um, SI to get those background screens um, done annually. And then we have a um, page within our, our website again, um, so the nwba.org um, for background checks. So if you have questions about the policies or um, want to know more specifics about it, all of the information um, is also posted on our website in addition to being part of that, um, that non-athlete registration. So now shifting into concussion safety. So again, this isn't really a change from the past. It's just reiterating all of the information that we have out there in the, in the um, category of athlete safety. So the NWBA understands the severity of concussions and is dedicated to preventing them within our organization. So we've utilized the practices with the um, CDC and the Prevention's head, Heads Up program to educate our members on the prevention of concussions and what to do in the case of suspected concussions. So all of that information, that um, piece that I read there, um, along with a free online training course and educational materials, um, as well as videos are also posted on our website um, under the concussion safety tab. So, again, the nwba.org and then concussion safety. So just look for that information to find, um, you know, those additional resources. And then there's another resource here if you want additional information where that concussion information is posted on the CDC website. So the link's there as well. Um, so the NWBA membership registration process includes a required acknowledgement of the included um, concussion information in the Heads Up program. So that's uh, basically one of the waivers that's required to go through the process is to know and understand um, that concussion information. So just touching here on, um, again, the membership registration um, process, this includes an electronic signature that's required for the code of conduct, the waiver of liability, and the hold harmless waiver. So the code of conduct is, um, and, and the waiver in, um, has been around for a while. Those, those things aren't anything new. Um, it's posted on our website. Um, the waiver of liability uh, is for the code of conduct. The waiver of liability basically helps um, members to understand the assumed known risks associated with participating in NWBA activities. So it's important to know that piece too, just to understand those assumed risks. And then just touching briefly on the whole hold harmless waiver, which is going to be a new document or a new waiver included with the membership registration for this season um, and moving forward. It's, a docu it's the waiver that holds NWBA harmless in activities where there's risk of exposure to communicable diseases, including but not limited to COVID-19. So Brandon briefly touched on that um, last week in his presentation when he went over membership registrations, but this is just kind of reiterating um, that piece there. And so just to point out, these documents are an important part of what helps the NWBA in building a safe culture for our sport and creating a safe environment for all of our members. So this again, just is another piece of that athlete safety that we're trying to make our number one priority. So this next piece talks about return to play um, and also the COVID-19 um, resources and, and, and the updates. So um, Brandon also touched on this a little bit in his webinar um, last week, but again, it's important information that we want everyone to be, everyone to know and be familiar with. So that return to play piece, so the NWBA took 
um, a very intentional and systematic approach to seeking input from athletes, members, divisional leadership, and other stakeholders on the return to play for this coming season. Um, so it included a member survey, which most of you um, probably received and, and hopefully took part in, team representative survey, ongoing dialogue with divisional leadership, local organization organizing committees, um, and, and many other people that had um, a part in that. So again, here on our website, which I feel like a, a broken record here, but um, so it has the, all of the information about the NWBA's approach and guidelines for that return to play piece. Um, and the, the website's there on our, or the link is there on, on that website. Um, and then going into the COVID-19 resources and updates. So we have a centralized important resources and information on the COVID-19 pandemic. Those resources provide um, members with the most trusted health organizations and applicable information for you to reference as it relates to COVID-19. Um, so all those resources again are on our website, nwba.org, COVID-19. And those websites are updated on a regular basis. So know if there's information there that you're looking for, just keep checking back. If there's you know, specific questions, you can always reach out and ask us, um, but just know those, those websites are, are updated regularly. So keep looking there to find more information. So I've done a lot of talking and just wanted to see if anybody has questions about anything, not just safe sport. It's, uh, it's Will, I don't have a question, but more of a statement. Um, and I don't know how familiar everyone is with the fact that um, a lot of our guidance on policies and procedures are related to our relationship with the USOPC. And one of the biggest benefits that we get out of the relationship with the USOPC is that they're really on the leading edge as it relates to um, things like uh, a culture of safety. You know, I, I know that historically they've gotten some negative press related to what happened in some of the sports, but they've really been um, pushing a lot of the sport organizations to take their safety programs to the next level. And they really helped us um, become uh, more expert like in the space. And so they keep us sort of on the leading edge with, with everything that we're doing. And we really couldn't do half of these things that we're doing without the great support of, um, of the US OPC. And, you know, I, I know that it's really a uh, legalese document and uh, some of the language is um, overwhelming, but it's so important for people as they're going through the registration and the training to make sure that you're really owning the responsibility of, of understanding it. The last thing we want to happen is that people feel like safe sport and the policies and some of the language that you sign on, that it's a rubber stamp. It's one thing that you absolutely have to understand to a deep level because, um, you know, it's not that we don't want to be on the cover of a newspaper. We don't want any one athlete to go through a, a negative experience as uh, they're participating in wheelchair basketball. We want to keep our athletes as safe as possible and treat them all like they're our own children and uh, making sure that they're safe. So, you know, just take that ownership uh, as, as seriously as you can in, in making sure and then understand that we're here for all of you as you have questions and, and you try to understand it further. Um, don't hesitate to make sure that you're asking those questions. That's what we're here for. And certainly we can tap into the Center for Safe Sport as well because uh, they're here to provide that service as well. Um, then so that I don't forget it, I, I just want to say uh, thanks to Christina, who's been an incredible uh, leader for our webinar series. So she really helped us get this format off the ground. So we had uh, feedback that we solicited and we wanted to figure out how we can uh, get uh, the feedback needs uh, wrecking or um, implemented. And so we came up with the webinar series format and she's been great about getting presenters and helping to make sure we've got the content ready and on time and the technology's working and, and all of that. 
we appreciate another um, another great story of somebody giving back to the sport. And um, she's also on our coach education committee, so we're not going to let her, uh, you know, slip into the night uh, without helping us uh, stay on board the coach education uh, committee. So thank you, Christina. We really appreciate all your help. Thank you, Will. Um, I, I wanted to take a moment just because this is my last one tonight, just to thank Will and Brandon for working with me and helping me finish this practicum because I know everything that I'm taking away from this is going to be invaluable with like my, my career endeavors. Um, so thank you very much for that and, and give me the opportunity to give back again. So um, I, this, this organization has given me a lot in my lifetime. So um, it's only fair that I give a little bit back uh, whenever I whenever I can. So thank you. And thank you, Tina, for your presentation tonight. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, looking at the chat box, I didn't see a lot of things got answered. Um, so I think that we don't have too many questions unless Brandon, you saw anything that we need to cover. I think there were a couple that we're going to take offline, Christina. So we're going to okay. have a follow up with uh, Nate Carruth, the most loyal and dedicated attendee to the webinar series. And uh, okay. then uh, there's a follow up with Gwenna as well that we're going to have uh, offline uh, to, to answer a question. But if if any other questions beyond those, um, feel free to type them into the chat box. We'll give it a minute. and if if no others, after that minute, we'll probably wrap up. Well, I'll just I'll take that minute to just to just say thank you for um, for Christina to to cover this topic. I know it's it's some pretty heavy material and it's not a fun topic a lot of times to talk through and it's very policy oriented and so. Um, it's it's good to be able to get the information out there in a digestible way and um, and to talk through some of these things. So thanks for making us part of your your courses. All right. Well, with that, uh, Christina, thank you again. And maybe we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. I don't see anything else that's uh, come through the chat box. But thank you, Tina. And yep. uh, thanks to you who have uh, been for the for the session. And we'll make sure to uh, continue to communicate the upcoming sessions. And we'll post the video online, as we have been, on uh, the site that will be presented by ABC Medical. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. <laughs>